So we'll be imaging uh, active cellar surfaces, and there will be uh, Rachel. Rachel. Rachel Rottenbacher. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be discussing um, imaging active surfaces with a bunch of different techniques. And so the first thing I want to tell you about is the type of stars that I am using to do this study. And they are typically RSCVN stars. So they're binary systems where the primary star is a giant star. And it typically shows evidence of calcium H and K variability as well as photometric variability. And they're usually in close, um, tidally locked orbits with a companion that's less evolved, so usually a main sequence star. And they have uh, orbital and rotation periods of about one to three weeks, something on that order. And so I'm just going to go do a brief overview of the different imaging techniques that I use. The first one is light curve inversion, where you simply have a light curve and recreate a surface that would make that light curve. Um, this is great for showing rotational modulation and locating where the spots are on the surface in longitude, but it suffers from a lot of degeneracies when trying to locate the spots in latitude. You don't get very much information, if any at all, from that. Um, and you also have to give a lot of input parameters into the light curve inversion models. Uh, you have to give photospheric temperature, spot temperature, inclination, limb darkening coefficients, all these sorts of things um, to, just figure, to just get a look at the rotational modulation. But the great advantage of this is that if you have a light curve that shows rotational modulation, you can get an idea of what the spots look like on that that are causing that feature. The next uh, method that we look at is Doppler imaging, and this is a little bit more complicated. This is where this, the um, features on the surface rotate across the surface and affect the absorption lines. And you can see in the animation that features near the equator are, are going to affect the absorption line across the whole absorption line, whereas features near the pole are going to affect more of the core of the line. So that gives you an idea that we're now able to start distinguishing latitude information uh, when using this method. But there are still some degeneracies with that where we have difficulty um, identifying which um, hemisphere the spots are in in some cases. And this is also starting to require more, uh, more data and more observation time than the light curve. We need high resolution, high signal to noise spectra to do this, and we need pretty good phase coverage. Um, and we also need the stars to rotate more rapidly, so we're starting to cut down the number of stars that we can actually observe with these techniques. The third method is interferometric imaging. This is a technique uh, where you have light coming from a star hitting an array of telescopes. Um, the light then travels um, through some delay lines to make sure that the distance that the light travels is all equal so it hits the detector at the same point in time. This is a great technique for being able to really directly see what the surface of the star looks like. We will be able to see unambiguously the features on the surface of the star. Um, and it's also an amazing technique because the bigger uh, you build your interferometers, the smaller the details you can see on the surface of the star. But that's also one of its fundamental limitations because it's really expensive to continuously build bigger and bigger interferometers. So for the moment, we're really restricted to spatially large, on the order of um, milliarc seconds, um, stars to see features on the surface. And they also need to be rather bright. And so I'm just going to take a few moments to spend a little bit more time on interferometry because um, it's probably the least commonly understood of these techniques. Um, for this project, I use um, Georgia State University Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy, or CHARA array. It's located outside of Los Angeles on Mount Wilson and consists of six one meter class telescopes in a Y-shaped configuration. The baselines uh, range from about 30 to 330 meters. And with this, I use the Michigan Infrared Combiner, or MERC which has recently been upgraded to Merck X in a collaboration between the Universities of Michigan and Exeter. Um, this instrument is perfect for imaging the surfaces of stars because it is the only instrument at Chara that combines all six uh, telescopes, and it also works in H-band. And so the algorithm that I used was written by John Monnier, uh, who was my PhD advisor. It's called surface imaging, or surfing. And it's really analogous to the, the methods that we use for the Doppler imaging in, in that you have multiple epochs of data. So we observe the star for the entire rotation. And we plot the, the information from those onto the surface all at once. So ideally, each pixel on the surface of the star is mapped to by several epochs of observation. And so now I'm going to show you some results. We have simultaneous data sets. Um, for we got photometry, spectroscopy, and the interferometry all at the same time for an RSCVN for stars. 
So the first one I'm going to show you is Sigma Geminorum. This is an RSDVN with a rotation period and an orbital period of about 19.6 days. This is the light curve inversion image. These are going to be ATOF projections, so it's the whole surface of the star at once. Above the dashed line at the top is actually the part of the star that we can't see due to inclination. And uh, the, you can see the uh, temperature scale on the right. And this, so this is the light curve inversion image. This was created with B and V filters. Um, you can see two distinct spots. Uh, they appear to be at the same latitude, which could be coincidence that the spots are actually at the same latitude, or it could just be an illustration that the um, light curve inversion doesn't have the ability to distinguish the latitude. Um, the next image is the Doppler imaging, and I want to emphasize that this is on a different temperature scale, and I also want to emphasize that with the light curve inversion, we assigned the spot in the photospheric temperature, so keep that in mind. Um, with the Doppler imaging, you can see that there's a big... Um, there's um, these spot features here that are, seem to be pretty consistent with the spot features here, suggesting that the light curve inversion, in fact, we can't really distinguish the um, latitude of the spots. There's also this higher latitude information that we wouldn't be able to see because it doesn't cause a rotational modulation. Then we compare that to the interferometric image, and you can see that the large spot features seem to be pretty consistent across all three images. And I want to point out that in the interferometry, we don't have very good phase coverage over here. We only had one night of data. So you see some indication of the um, features in the Doppler imaging that might be consistent with the interferometry. Now, this is incredibly exciting, at least to me, to be able to have these different imaging techniques give rather similar images. Um, but it wasn't just enough for us to compare it by looking at it. So we actually took these images and got the light curve that these would create and compared it to the observed light curve. So we converted this H-band surface, or what was observed in H-band, to a V-band and the spectrum into, also into a V-band. And we compared it to the observed V-band light curve. The light curve, um, as observed, is in the gray points. And um, the comparisons from the models are in, and the images are in the red dashed line. Um, the bottom panel is the light curve inversion, and thankfully the, Im the light curve that is created from the light curve inversion reconstruction matches the light curve, which is fantastic because that was the input. Um, the, the light curve was not used as input for the Doppler imaging or the interferometry. Just want to emphasize that. But we see that the same structure, with, we have the, the dip in the middle for both the light curve, uh, for um, both the Doppler and the interferometry. So this is pretty exciting that for a simple spot surface, we're able to get pretty similar results between the different imaging techniques. Uh, fortunately, we were able to observe Sigma Jump again the next year in 2012, and the surface got a little bit more complicated. So this is again the um, B and V combined light curve inversion surface combined or compared to the Doppler imaging, and you can see again there's this high latitude stuff going on here. Um, to, that we can't see evidence of in the light curve inversion, but maybe these higher or these lower latitude extensions might be what we're seeing with those spots. And then compared to the interferometric image, which to me sort of looks like a combination of those two, um, we can see that they, it seems to look uh, more consistent. But uh, we did the same thing where we looked at the, the light curve that each of those would have created and compared it. And the interferometry and the light curve inversion seem to give similar shapes to their light curves, the Doppler imaging is a little bit different. So we're really starting to understand the, the strengths and the weaknesses of these different techniques. Um, the other star that I've done this with and we have these, um, these data sets for is Zeta Andromeda. This is another RSCVN. It has a, a rotational orbital period of about 17.6 days. Um, this was, was shown a couple times this morning. Um, this was the 2013 epoch where you can see the strong spot feature uh, on the pole as well as um, asymmetric features or asymmetric spots above and below the equator suggesting that the dynamo creating this is a little bit different than the solar dynamo. Um, so we're working with collaborators on um, the Doppler imaging. So this is a, prelim a preliminary Doppler image where you can see that the polar spot is consistent. This is contemporaneous again as it was with um, Sigma Gem. Um, you can see that it's the algorithm struggling a little bit more to properly locate where the um, spots are and what latitude those are in. Um, but the next step that we're doing with this is we're going beyond just taking these surfaces and seeing what kind of light curve they would create. We're actually looking at what kind of spectra 
the interferometric image would create. So we can compare that to the actual observed spectra. So going a step further. Um, and uh, just to show uh, these images, as they appeared on the sky to Merck um, in H-band, there's sigma gem, the two, the one on the upper left and the middle are sigma gem in the 2011 and 2012, and then on the upper right is zeta and in 2013. And if you look closely, you can see the polar spot on zeta and, and you can also see the ellipticity of the star pretty, um, pretty well and seeing it sort of breathe in and out on the side. And again, this is how it appeared to Merck. So these are an H band, um, as you know, the previous ones I had shown you were temperatures to really emphasize the, the dynamic range of the, the surface. So, uh, so uh, that's, what, that's what we have with these. Um, I haven't had very much success at CHAR in the last few years, but this, um, this winter we're going to be trying to push this technique a little bit further, and we're going to be observing Epsilon Eridani, which is a main sequence star, sun-like star, um, to see what kind of features we can see on that. Um, and that's the, the next step for this. And just because I have a little bit extra time, I wanted to advertise our splinter session this afternoon. If you haven't had enough of star spots after the talks th today or this morning, please help, please join in the discussion later on today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, okay, so here first, second. Ian Crossfield, MIT. Great stuff. Thank you. Uh, are you thinking at all about a single combined fit using the light curve, the Doppler imaging, and Chara, all for a single map? Yes, that has been something that's been under discussion. Fabian Barone at Georgia State is very interested in doing that because I have these incredible data sets. Um, I know he has worked on um, at least parts of the code. He has the imaging for the interferometry. I know he's worked on a light curve inversion, and I don't think he's yet merged them, but it is, it is in the future, and I hope it's soon. Hi, um, thank you for last talk. Um, uh, Emre Oshik from Max Planck Institute. Uh, so, um, first of all, the, the latitudinal information sh shouldn't be there at all, right, in the light curve inversions, whereas you have really systematic differences between uh, both spots. All the spots were uh, near, the, our, our, um, uh, the, near the center of the visible star, that's yeah. fine, but, uh, and it's my second comment, it's just a comment, is just, just that the, 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 when you say uh, that the dynamo in, in a particular star should be working differently, well, I am not so sure of that as a theoretical interpretation because the dynamo can be well, very similar to the solar dynamo in the interior, but the surface manifestations might be different. So, um, first with the, the latitude information, sometimes you can get relative latitude information out of the light curve inversion if you have multiple filters and you have sufficient information. So you can get some information, and yes, the images I showed of Sigma Gem, the, the spots were sort of at the sub-Earth point, so they were all like at the, in the center of the the disk as we could see it. So we didn't have enough information there. And with the, the second point with the dynamo, all that I mean by that is that we don't see um, the sort of symmetry of where the spots exist on the sun above and below the equator. Uh, we don't see that with Zeta Andromeda. We very distinctly see big spots in, the, in one hemisphere. And so I'm just pointing out that there's a, a difference in how it's manifesting, uh, which is something I'd be happy to talk to the dynamo modelers about and learn more about that. Uh, Chris Johns Kroll, Rice University. Um, can you remind us what the V sine i of the stars you've shown are, and then when you do epsilon airy, are you going to be doing all three techniques and doing the same sort of comparison? Um, so I don't remember exactly what the V sine i's are for all of them, but I think they're at least 20 kilometers a second, which my collaborator Heidi Krohonen is nodding her head. Um, epsilon Eridani does have a lower V sine i, so we will not be doing the Doppler imaging, but we will also be getting simultaneous spectra to monitor the activity as it changes through it, because we know that that's a limitation. We will be getting the simultaneous photometry, though. Uh, Irina Kityashvili, NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, have you tried look uh, synoptic like uh, uh, maps? Because you, I believe you have probably a time series of sunspots uh, or star spots. 
and uh, probably you can look uh, time evolution. Um, so we have a time series with the um, with the light curve that's been observed for about 30 years for sigma gem and zeta and um, these were just individual snapshots of a single rotation. I did leave that point out that those all those maps were made from one or one and a half rotations, whatever it took to get the full rotation. So we don't really see evolution, and we assume that we're not really seeing evolution spots. Of course, there may be some, um, but we do have a long time series for the light curve. Um, so that you know, looking into the evolution of that, there have been studies with the sigma gem light curve to do just that. Um, I don't remember the first author on it, but it's Greg Henry's um, light curve. Hi, Rachel Austin, Space Telescope Science Institute. Over here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, it was a nice talk, and I had just one question for of clarification. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that when you um, you did the observations for the interferometry, you only had a few days, mm -hmm. um, but I must, was that over, must have been over the entire rotation period. Yeah. Right. Okay. So does the the fact that you are getting sort of consistent results between the three techniques, but that that ob observation technique at least is less telescope intensive, mm -hmm. um, does that enable you to expand your technique to other types of stars where you don't necessarily have some of the restrictions from uh, spectroscopy and whatnot? So I, I will recomment on the, the lack of data. We had three nights of data where the spots were present, which was incredibly fortunate. And then on the opposite side, we only had one night of data. So we did have full phase coverage. It just wasn't very good on the back. As well as for expanding it, um, because we're starting to believe more reliably that the interferometry is showing what we're, we're, we want it to see, it is being expanded to other, other systems. Um, there's a group at, at Georgia State doing supergiants and looking at the convective cells of those, and there are people that have been looking at um, novae and expansion. So there's all kinds of things that we can apply the interferometry to. So yeah. you don't need to have all of this. All La of them last question. Uh, Timo Reinhold, uh, Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research, Göttingen. Um, I have a question about the degeneracy of this lack of inversion technique. So if you would think of a peppered star with um, spots distributed all over the star and slightly more spots on the one to the other side. So I think you would also get like this one dip shape mm -hmm. in the light curve. So um, could you rule such a spatial distribution of spots out by one of the other methods? Yeah, so that's a very good point and a, a known problem with the light curve inversion. If you have a completely spotted surface, it will just sort of look smooth in the light curve. And so if you have more of them concentrated on one side, you'll get that dip. Yes, that's, that's a, a known issue. Um, you can start constraining that by having um, information from the spectrum. So having these additional methods can help us you know, sort of improve our light curve inversion, but when you have the other methods, it might be favorable to use those. But I do believe that there is information in the spectra that you can use to help constrain to get an idea of if you're missing something. But anything that's not rotationally modulating, like uh, the peppered spots all over it, or a polar spot, or a band of spots, we're not going to see that with the light curve inversion. And that's, that's a known problem, and we try to be honest about that and say that this is just a, a representation of what the surface could look like. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Rachel again.